let's uh, try to get started now. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we have a distinguished uh, speaker here tonight. Uh, the uh, Journalism and Mass Communication Department, along with the Society of Professional Journalists, the Students for a New Age, and the Committee on Lectures, uh, brings you this presentation uh, for the evening. Uh, tonight we have with us Coleman McCarthy, who's a columnist with the Washington Post and has been with that uh, newspaper since 1969. Uh, he's been syndicated in approximately uh, 60 newspapers um, in the nation and approximately five college newspapers. Um, he's with the Washington uh, Post Writers Group. Um, he doesn't vote. He uh, refuses to sit on a jury. Uh, he says he's a vegetarian and a pacifist. Uh, he's been the uh, veteran of 17 marathon runs and says he refuses to go to church because he uh, would rather attend the soup kitchens where he can see a sermon rather than hear one. <laughs> Uh, Coleman McCarthy was educated in the public schools of Nassau County, Long Island. Uh, he graduated from Spring Hill College in Mob Mobile, Alabama in 1960, majoring in English and minoring in philosophy. Uh, following college, he spent five years farming in rural Georgia. Uh, he lives in Washington with his wife and three sons. Uh, he says, it's, a li it's lively at home, he says. My wife is a Goldwater conservative, conservative and my kids like Ronald Reagan. Starting with his hair, uh, start, okay, with Ronald Reagan. So I'm a lone liberal against four conservatives. Those are just the kind of odds that keep me alert. Uh, the Washington Post Writers Group says that uh, Coleman McCarthy is a fresh voice in the liberal tradition. Uh, they, they go on to say there's a lot of tired blood flowing in liberal veins these days. Uh, some of it shows up on the editorial pages. If your readers are looking for some fresh thinking and a stylish writing from the liberal camp, we have the man. And we have the man with us tonight, Coleman McCarthy. Thank you, Finn, very much for that, uh, that uh, uh, semi-accurate uh, uh, introduction. I don't vote, I don't go to church. Yeah, I must be uh, right from, uh, from uh, the darker regions. But uh, let me explain, we have a bishop here now. You ought to start off with the church first. Uh, uh, where two or three are gathered together, uh, after all. Um, uh, uh, I, I do go to the soup kitchen on, on, I try to take my boys on Sunday morning, and I really go as much to learn about, about um, uh, Reaganomics as I do anything else. Uh, you go among those folks and you learn very quickly what's happening to our country. Uh, I did do some farming after college. Uh, in fact, in fact, a lot of my, uh, I, I learned how to shovel uh, manure. In fact, a lot of my right-wing critics uh, say that I'm still shoveling manure. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for coming out tonight. We have a nice, uh, lively group here. I see, I see a lot of the, uh, of the left is here, the old and the new left, and the weary left. And uh, I was a great place to come to. I'm always refreshed out here. In fact, in fact, I was talking to, um, I hope, is your next uh, senator, uh, Tom Harkin. Uh, uh, I've been trying to push Tom a little bit further uh, to the left. Uh, uh, <laughs> he's one of those moderates, though, the center of the road where all the head-on crashes are, I'm warning him. Uh, uh, the middle of the road, and and he's really an old pal. I knew him before I even ran for Congress, and and we go way back. He's a he's he's truly a a um, both a personally kind man. He has a sense of outrage, and and he's been very effective in Congress. In fact, I remember I wrote a column when he went to El Salvador uh, long before long before it became fashionable to go to Salvador. In fact. He told me he went to mass, and 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 uh, at Easter Sunday he was there Holy Thursday, and an archbishop, then an obscure archbishop, Romero, said mass, and and Tom described what an old ramshackle church it was, and birds flew out of the out of the windows. They didn't fix anything, and 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 he. 
he asked the Archbishop, why don't they spend more money on fixing the place up? After all, get a building program going the way the American Catholics do when a little chip falls from the ceiling. We do a little fundraising and uh, fix up the organ, get the beer cans out of the organ uh, pipes. And and so he got to know the Archbishop, and, he said, and it was very simple. We just spend the money on food and housing and shelter, and if God wants us to worship outside in the square, we'll do that. And it seems as though he's sending us a message not to worry about the buildings. And that's an old uh, uh, thought uh, that all the early church fathers had, I think. So Tom was there long, became, long before it became liberal chic to go down to Salvador. And... And so I admire him very much for that. He's been a good, a good, reliable source when I write columns about that part of the world. He's, he's effective, and, and um, I hope, I hope he, 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 he rallies support here in Iowa. We need him as a senator. After all, after all Iowa is unique in an odd kind of way in Washington. Uh, uh, you're known as the only state in the union uh, that sends uh, to Washington a worse senator than Charles uh, Grassley. Uh, so, uh, so get known for something else. I, uh, it used to be it used to be Nebraska could claim that that they sent a worse senator than Carl Munt, and that was um, who was it? Uh, Curtis, uh, Carl Curtis, or Ruska? Yes, Roman Ruska. So the joke goes around, but it's Iowa's burden right now. Uh, <laughs> So do something about that and give us time. I will uh, talk a little while about some of the uh, values I have as a journalist, as a citizen, as, as someone trying to make sense of, of, our, of our planet and world. And then, and then we'll uh, talk a little bit, and then we'll have some, have some questions and answers, uh, some, uh, some dissent, I hope. There's always a few uh, Reaganites here in groups like this, uh, perhaps waiting for me, perhaps waiting for you. And and uh, <laughs> and, so, and so I welcome any kind of any kind of dissent. I do make my living expressing my views as a columnist. It's a great blessing uh, to be able to make one's living a as a journalist. Uh, uh, I was in Haiti just the other day, uh, trying to get some of my brothers and sisters out of jail down there, where they, uh, there, uh, there is no free press, as you know, in Haiti. It's the poorest country in the world. And, uh, and uh, so I went there to try to, uh, to see what uh, 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 a contribution I could make to, uh, to easing uh, the journalist um, agonies. So we'll talk and have a nice visit and, and, and try to learn a little bit from each other. I was, I was reminded of some of the themes that I've been working on as a writer, and I'm sure all of you have, have felt in, in some of your um, uh, commitments. Uh, when I was leaving uh, Washington um, on Friday afternoon, I had a phone call from an old friend of mine, and I got to know this man in the early 1970s. When he called me after, after a serious uh, accident in his family, it seems his little boy, uh, age five or six, woke up uh, one early, early winter morning and went down the living room and started to play with, uh, play with matches. And as often happens, uh, at the end of his, uh, of his pajama sleeves caught fire. And, and before anybody could hear the shrieks of his, of his agony are uh, calling out. He, he, uh, he was consumed by flames. And they finally came down. His mother and father woke up, put the fire out in the flames. He, and his upper trunk was burned severely. So they brought him down to a local little health clinic in the New Hampshire village. They couldn't do much for him there. So they went to Boston and to the burn hospital uh, that's run by the Shriners. And maybe some of you know that hospital. It's a very famous one. The doctors are there. And so the father called me, asked if I could come up and perhaps uh, do a column about what had happened because the pajamas he was wearing were not uh, flame food. This was in the early 70s. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll come up as soon as I can. Well, I went to Boston, went to the hospital, went to the burn ward. 
And there are about 25 uh, boys and girls, mostly there in the hospital because their uh, uh, pajamas had caught fire. And I said to the father and mother how, how really shocked I was. And, and people think that uh, the journalists become hardened and, and immune to some of the uh, suffering that we see in the world in our daily, in our daily work. And, and, and it's true that we do have to learn, as many of you do in your jobs, I'm sure, learn how to switch off, as, as the psychiatrists call it, to keep our mental health. And, but for me, this was the most difficult scene that I've ever been in, really, seeing 25 children, most of them uh, burned, uh, sleepwear and clothing. And, and chaplains in hospitals will always inform you that burn injuries are the, are the severest form of suffering that we know and can endure. And there were the burned children. So I said to the father how shocked I was, and, and he said, well, well, I'm grateful to you for coming and, and, uh, and do a story about the, about the pajamas, but if you really want to see a, a more a shocking sh a sight, we'll show you something else. Led me across the street to a large clothing store, a kind of the Macy's <coughs> in Boston. And we made our way around the escalator, wasn't sure where we're going, and we finally got to the children's uh, clothing section. And he reached over on the shelf and pulled out a pair of pajamas, all wrapped up very nicely, and then they were on sale, of course. And, and the father said that these, uh, take a look at these, these are the same uh, type of pajamas, the same brand, same company, uh, they're not flame proof, and they're still selling them. And that's the outrage, he said, that's the horror. And what he said has always struck me as one of the uh, profound insights about, about American culture, that we have become adjusted to so many abuses, large and small, uh, uh, that uh, that adjustment now becomes really the overall, the overriding cultural ailment that we have in our society. Uh, anybody who refuses to adjust is is seen as some a son of a, a rebel and an an odd one out, a little bit screwball, eccentric. And all of you, I'm sure, in some of your commitments uh, have have felt that when you protest something, if you did have refused to go along, uh, you're branded somehow as odd as a renegade. Uh, there's that beautiful line from a, a play uh, by T.S. Eliot. Uh, in a world of fugitives, uh, the one who runs in the opposite way is seen as the madman. And I think a lot of us sometimes, I know I do, I often feel that I'm a little bit mad, a little bit crazy, unsettled, because I refuse to adjust to things like uh, pajamas that burn kids. They finally passed a few laws, put the chemical uh, tris, as you remember, into it, and that just gives the kids cancer. So uh, a corporate America is not burning our kids anymore, they're only giving them cancer. So that's the big improvement in the boardroom. Uh, uh, the outrages are there, we know what they are. We have governments uh, that lie to us, governments that use immense amounts of violence. In the world, uh, we know that 40,000 people uh, uh, succumb every day to hunger and malnutrition uh, diseases, uh, die every day. Uh, they're dying 40,000 a day. In the U.S., what are we doing? Uh, we are making three uh, new nuclear our weapons every 24 hours. Uh, we've become adjusted to the violence in large forms like the nukes. It's not enough to criticize the generals and people like Reagan uh, for the nuclear arms uh, going. Or we have to get the, uh, the nuclear weapons out of our hearts first before we get them off the land physically. And I think a lot of us have to, have to, have to examine our consciences about the forms of violence that the that we give in to, not perhaps a direct violence, but indirect violence. I notice it particularly when I go around the country visiting uh, uh, college campuses at how many of them have ROTC uh, programs. Uh, I'm, always, I'm always unsettled by that. We're teaching another generation of people to settle disputes through violence. 
That's what the ROTC represents. They teach the kids how to shoot guns. Of course, they never call it that. They never call it killing. It's always command skills. Uh, I hear that from the kids. Oh, well, they're teaching me how to be a man and command skills I'm getting. Uh, so right now, we have on American campuses uh, 1,200 ROTC uh, sites. At the same time, uh, how many how many colleges are offering degrees in peace studies and conflict uh, resolving programs? Only 80. 80 is not bad. I, uh, 10 years ago, there was only one college offering a degree in peace studies. Uh, St. Francis, fittingly, in Brooklyn. And so, so we've gone from one 10 years ago to 80, uh, so, so we ought not to feel too badly, but still, the military is there. It's 1,200 to 80, and it, it, it's something that I don't like to adjust to. And, and, uh, but that's just one uh, um, a large example. I'll tell you some funny ones a little bit. Uh, as, uh, as Finn was saying, my wife's a very liberated uh, 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 citizen, and part of her liberation is to get me to do the family shopping. Uh, which all husbands ought to do more of. I've been doing it for about 15 years now. And I decided not to let it get to me and, and learn a little bit from what's going on in the supermarkets, after all. Uh, so I started to get interested in, in the way corporations market their food. And one of the things I, I, I have three sons, they love ice cream, so I, I like to buy them ice cream for the kiddies, and I buy the half gallons, and I started to get very confused by the prices. I'm sure you've seen all different uh, uh, brands and prices, and I started to uh, make a, an effort to figure it out by weighing the ice cream. And this kind of alarms the checkout clerks when they see... Uh, 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 here he is again, they would always say to each other. I'd go over about four or five half gallons and weigh this one and try to mark down how much they cost. And, and, uh, and, and I really couldn't figure it out till I learned uh, from the Food and Drug um, Agency Administration that the manufacturers are allowed to put 50% uh, air into ice cream. And, and that uh, explains the various weight differences and the price differences are often only five cents uh, for a half an ounce difference, and sometimes 25 cents. So then it, it dawned on me that, uh, that uh, if, if ice cream is 50% is air, all of us here, every other breath, we're eating ice cream. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Uh, so once, once I discovered that uh, profundity, I started to weigh other things, and I began to weigh the eggs. And then that really alarmed the checkout clerks. Uh, <laughs> and I learned there, well, they have the jumbo and the extra jumbo and the medium and small and medium small and hyphenated and about 10 different sizes for eggs. And, 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 of course, the price difference between the medium and extra large is often only a, an ounce or so, but sometimes as much as 25 cents. And so you say to yourself, my heavens, these thieves are doing this robbing right in front of me. Uh, and, and what are they doing when, uh, when we're not even watching them? Yeah, so uh, uh, so I, <laughs> I'm suggesting if you're having a little bit of trouble of things you want to refuse to adjust to, uh, start with the ice cream, and then go to the eggs, and then finish up with the nukes. And, and uh, uh, start small, as they say. Start with the ice cream row. So uh, there's a lot of things out there to refuse to, uh, to, become, uh, to become adjusted to, as I think is the major issue right now. And people have to start where we are. Some person might be way ahead. Some, is, uh, some of us uh, are just starting out. And, and it depends where you want to begin. But I think, I think emotionally and spiritually for one's inner, inner health and, and inner, and inner uh, uh, goals, I think it's good to have something that you just uh, refuse to cave into. 
And, and you don't need to, but to broadcast it. A lot of the liberals uh, like to, uh, and they don't do anything without going to the, but to the Xerox machine and writing a press release about it. Uh, uh, just do it and see how it goes and come back with the news five or ten years later and, and see what happens. Uh, uh, and that, uh, and that is, is a way of defining uh, the problem, I think, and it's easy to define that we have adjusted. We all know this is nothing new. What is the solution? And I'll talk a little bit about some of those, and then we'll, as I say, open it up to some a discussion and questions and answers. Uh, and and this is my fourth talk today. I talked to the, I talked over at the at the university to the health and fitness class this morning. I'm a runner and I'm a, I like to eat my veggies and we talked to the kids about that. And then I went to, to one of the um, uh, journalism classes and then I went to uh, another journalism class and now I'm getting laryngitis. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, so I'm, uh, I want to talk about some of the, uh, some of the uh, solutions. Uh, and there are three. And we have to have all three of these, I think, to really be effective and to have a sense that we are uh, moving forward. Uh, these uh, begin uh, very simply with prayer, and the second one is, is service, and the third is, is exorcism, driving out the evil. And we have to have all three of those things. Uh, now, I know it's a little bit odd for a secular journalist uh, to be talking about prayer. Uh, after all, what do we know about it? We're just a journalist. Well, if, if, if the airwaves can be filled with uh, uh, Jerry Falwell and, and Brother Reagan are talking about it, uh, <laughs> Uh, I might as well jump in and, 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 and really have a circus. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the thing about prayer, I think, I went over, I, I was in Dubuque yesterday, I dropped in on the Trappist uh, fathers and brothers over there yesterday, and uh, 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 St. Benedict, as you know, wrote a beautiful rule in, in in the fifth century, and and Benedictine prayer has really always been uh, my favorite form. I guess it's kind of it's kind of not uh, not what we want from God, but what God wants from us. Americans have a little hard time with that. We we usually have the gimmies. We like the gimme prayers, and and we ask God to get us through, uh, get us a good grade, or get us a good uh, wife or husband, or get us a good job, and. And we lack that Eastern mysticism of just being a little bit quiet and resting and just opening one's heart and mind and, and waiting for something to come in. How long do you have to wait? Well, I don't know. Some of the early church fathers waited uh, years and years and, and decades. And then, and, and then even then, we weren't always sure that they uh, did a great job. I remember that scandalous story about St. Francis, as you remember, when he was dying, uh, and he died at age 43, a very young man. Uh, all the fathers and brothers and, and the bishop came, and they wanted to hear his final words. And they gathered around the bed, and oh, this is going to be some occasion to hear the, as soon as the saint went off to heaven, we'll get his, his last words, and it'll really be some day in the town. Uh, and uh, and so they all gathered around the bed and hovered over and now Francis you're ready to go what are your last words uh, and he looked up at the bishop and said uh, uh, I want a chocolate eclair uh, <laughs> so, so I think that's very beautiful the saints uh, uh, if Francis can go easy on himself I think we can too and not to worry about going so hard on ourselves. Uh, uh, I think a lot of people who do take prayer seriously get, uh, get too wrapped up. They don't want to give the idea that they might be, uh, uh, they might be enjoying life. After all, saints don't do that. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, but people who do have a well, a developed sense of prayer, I think also have a great, have a great uh, lightheartedness, perhaps, a good sense of humor. And, 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 and I noticed the old Trappist lay brother, he was full of stories yesterday, and he was very witty, and, uh, and it really was very refreshing to meet him. Uh, so I think that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we all, all of us, all of us in this room, or probably most of us, lead lives uh, as soft as a souffle. And so we're asked to give something back. Uh, uh, I think that's scriptural. Even he or she of whom much is asked, uh, much is given, much will be asked. It's basic. Uh, so I think that that has a lot to do with, uh, with prayer also. And if you have trouble believing in God, as many of us do, we go through the dark and, and night of the soul, as John of the Cross called it. Uh, if we can't believe in God, well, uh, believe in, in belief. Uh, and I think that's, that's something we have to do and think about that. If we don't have any formal church affiliation, if you're going through a little uh, period where you'd rather go to the soup kitchen on Sunday mornings, wait till they get a good uh, fellow can give a good sermon, then you go back. Uh, uh, as I'm doing, I guess, uh, I, I think that's okay also. After all, we do, uh, all of us, whether we're Hindus or Muslims or Christians or Jews or, or atheists, or, or my favorite of all, a fallen away atheists. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, there's a lot of those out there now. They, uh, uh, they're not organized yet, but uh, <laughs> if we keep pushing them, they are going to be. Uh, so I think that uh, particularly now with so many hucksters running around uh, telling us what religion is, how we ought to vote, people like Swaggers and these, and these characters, it's, uh, uh, I'm glad they're talking. We have to get this out of out in the open, I think. It's been too much hidden what they're doing on, on Sunday mornings on those programs, uh, and, and now it's coming out in the open, so I think more and more people will really uh, see uh, the Falwell gang uh, for, what they, uh, for what it is. The second uh, necessity, I think, to be effective in our culture is to, is to develop a, a philosophy of service. And I mean by that that, uh, that we ought to use our skills in some way to, uh, to be easing the suffering in the world. It doesn't mean you have to go to, over, to, uh, over to the African countries and, and be a doctor and heal the open wounds of the poor there. You can just take care of somebody right across the street, <coughs> across the street rather than across the ocean. Uh, and nobody really needs to know much about it. Uh, you can do it very hidden, or very quiet, and 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 I think that I think we have trouble with with the idea of service in our country. I notice it a lot when people come into my home, and and they will invariably ask ask my children now are now boys, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up, and. All of us, I'm sure, we've heard that question. Maybe we've even asked it of kids. It's a very common question. But it is uh, the wrong question. Uh, we should be asking children uh, not what do you want to be when you grow up, but how do you want to serve society when you're ready to? And get the idea into children's heads very early on uh, that we expect some service from you. We expect you to give to others. And if we don't uh, talk like that to the kids, they're not going to hear it. They're not going to hear it uh, from the media and the advertising uh, be, uh, because we're busy uh, telling the kids to become rich and famous and buy things, uh, drink beer, get ahead, achieve, and, and messing them up that way, telling them lies. So unless we give them another message and ask early on, how do you want to serve society, they're not going to hear it. It's going to be tough enough anyway, even if they do hear it from us. But at least get that across. And, and I've been advocating for years that uh, in small ways, when I go to visit high schools, I always try to uh, corral the English uh, uh, faculty members and uh, uh, teachers and ask them what they think of an idea that I have. And some schools are trying it even. And that's to get uh, the English uh, courses to send the kids out to teach uh, the illiterate how to read. 
Yeah, and you'll learn more about English grammar that way. The kids will learn more that way than studying and memorizing by rote all the sonnets of Milton and Shakespeare that we're all so impressed by because the kids are going to get into graduate school now and make, and make a name for themselves. Uh, go teach somebody how to read. In this country right now, we have 35 million illiterates. Uh, other political people will immediately uh, uh, realize that 35 million illiterates, that's uh, uh, Ronald Reagan didn't get 35 million votes our last time. I sometimes think it's the same group. <laughs> Uh, but that would be uncharitable toward the illiterates, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> so if we get the kids out and teach people how to read, they'll learn. Uh, the victims will get a little bit out of it, and we'll all improve. It's a very simple form of service, and, and yet... Um, uh, we ought to be, uh, uh, I think most of the contributions we can make uh, are, are deceptively simple, um, I like that. At the kitchen I go, there, uh, there are about five or six uh, 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 kitchens within a mile of the White House right now. When you next go to Washington, uh, skip the monuments, uh, skip Congress, go to the Zacchaeus Soup Kitchen, go to Mount Carmel House run by the Carmelite Sisters for the Homeless, and there you'll see the real Washington. Uh, it's there. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a homeless uh, zone right around the White House, between the Capitol and the White House. Uh, the, uh, the country's largest shelter for homeless men and women is two blocks from the capital. Uh, it's two distinct uh, societies, really. The closest uh, person who lives uh, outside the White House and lives nearest the president outside the White House is a homeless woman named Mary. Uh, she's been living in front of the White House, uh, right by the guard station there, since about 1969. Uh, in snow drifts, in rainstorms, in summer heat, you'll see Mary there sleeping all night long. I talked I talk to her, I talked to the guards, and, and one of them said, oh, oh yeah, she's been here all these years. And, and, and they're very kindly toward her. They give her sandwiches and coffee in the morning, and they, and they get her blankets sometimes. In fact, one of the guards said that he confessed to me uh, that he really worries more about Mary than about Reagan, uh, uh, and I commended him for that. <laughs> and it struck me that that's really uh, the closest thing we have to a federal uh, program for the homeless. Uh, 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 and it's both funny and, and tragic, I think. Uh, uh, the administration is giving uh, has given not a nickel uh, to the new federal shelter. All they give was an old, an old run-down building and sent over Margaret Heckler to congratulate the president for being a, a wonderful Christian. And they haven't uh, uh, given one sentence to fire trap. And, and, and so uh, when you next go to, uh, to your capital, go there and see, and see what's going on. I think, I think you'll be surprised. Uh, the thing about uh, about service is that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the opportunities are all around us. A high school a political science uh, faculty member had a high school in Washington brings his class every every Saturday and Sunday, and he and he requires them to do I think a hundred or one hundred fifty hours a year to go there and just help out with the soup and talk to the men and women. And, and, and he told me that the kids learn more about uh, uh, politics and sociology and justice and, and mercy than they ever will uh, from any books he could have them read in the classroom. And, and, and lives are changed, he said. The kids at, at the end of the year come out of that experience 
uh, many of them uh, will be changed uh, forever. Uh, one uh, a small a contribution that I've been trying to make is is that I taught uh, for two years and I'm I'm still doing it at a local high school in Washington near my office, the school nearest my office. I've taught a course on nonviolence and and peace studies, uh, pacifism and conflict uh, resolving, and and I just uh, uh, two of my boys go to that school, and I just went over and asked if I could uh, teach the course. And they're a little surprised at first. What's that again? Uh, nonviolence. What's that all about? And and so I explained to them that we had Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Schweitzer and Jesus and Buddha. And Amos and, and Russell and Barrigan and Merton and Dar that's enough, they said. And uh, I, I come teach the course. So I went and taught, and the kids were, were delighted to hear about uh, this unknown subject of nonviolence and how it's worked throughout history. And, and I think that I'm teaching a course now at American, uh, at American U uh, on, on, on nonviolence. And, and I'm, I'm really very heartened by how many how many students want to uh, to, uh, to to study this and know about it. And I remember when the bishops issued their pastoral about the nuclear uh, issue a few years ago, just two years ago. Uh, I thought to myself how wonderful it would be if they followed this up with getting a peace studies a program and into every Catholic school in the country. We have this immense school system at our hands. And I know, I know a lot of the schools are doing that now, but we can't uh, leave it to high school. It's almost, it's almost too far gone by then. The kids have been conditioned uh, to believing uh, the slogans that our government puts out. We have to uh, hate our enemies. We have to get more weapons uh, to counteract uh, this enemy this year, the Russians, this decade, it'll be somebody else next decade. It's too late by high school, I think. It has to begin in the first grade. They have to know about, about, about the early Christian church being nonviolent, about why no Christians could go into the Roman army for three centuries. They didn't do it. It, it was exactly opposite. We have, it's in, it's in our genes, in our, in our theological genes. They ought to hear about Gandhi in the first grade and second grade and know about these people and King. Uh, uh, we now have a holiday after Martin Luther King. We have two holidays in our, our calendar after, after, after prominent Americans. One was a general who believed in violence, George Washington. Uh, the other was King who believed in nonviolence. So we have a nice, a nice uh, balance for once. It's a great victory, I think. And, and, and yet, um, I remember when that holiday bill uh, passed through Congress, it, it was the liberals who were really very uh, much uh, unaware of the significance. They, they uh, said, oh, King is a great civil rights leader. And you heard about, about Selma and all the marches. And you never heard a word that he was for nonviolence. It was as though... It was as though the senators were afraid to even suggest we had somebody who believed in nonviolence while they're passing all the all the programs for the MX and the B1s. It would have shamed us. So, uh, so I really admired much more people like Jesse Helms, who just called King a uh, a, a communist and a Marxist. At least, at least Helms uh, showed his, uh, that his ignorance was up front. Whereas the uh, the liberals, uh, they kind of patronized King. Oh, wasn't he good for civil rights? He was much more than that. He said in 1967, we're the most violent country on earth. And he was right about that. And he wanted us to change. And the way to change was through nonviolence. And the Barrigans have carried that on. And, and, yet, and yet when we... Uh, uh, we don't honor them too much. A few of us read their books and hold them high. I do, but all of us, all of us, I think, who do, who, who who do admire King and the Barrigans and Dorothy Day, feel as little bit as though we're outsiders. The church hasn't really uh, come uh, to embrace them wholeheartedly. Uh, certainly not uh, not the Archbishop of New York, the former chaplain 
for the military, O'Connor, uh, uh, um, uh, it's very, it's a very slow move, I think. Uh, uh, several of the hierarchy are, I think, and they are to be honored. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, that I'm suggesting that if you're looking around for something, to go ask the local uh, grade school, go ask the principal. Okay, uh, uh, or can I come in and teach nonviolence to the kiddies maybe one day a week and discuss Gandhi and what and, and what he did and King and Dorothy Day and Merton, who I think those two are the two most influential Catholics of this century, or Dorothy Day and Merton, the two most influential uh, even uh, even Christians, and they were both absolutist about nonviolence. It's a very a tough concept to get across. Yeah, but you got to defend yourself against those enemies. You always hear that one. And, and study it and read the literature. There's an immense amount of books and writing about, about nonviolence, how it has been effective, how it has worked. And, 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 and when you say that, uh, yeah, you got to defend yourself, that's exactly the point. Somebody who is nonviolent is a defending his ideas he's he or she is just not doing it through through violence are you doing it through nonviolence and and this to most Americans is very foreign very strange oh yes we need you you peace nicks it's nice that you're here talking about this and 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 I go over once a year I'm invited to the National War College to talk about pacifism and the generals are there, and the colonels, and then they got their ribbons on, and they get me in. Oh, listen, we love you to come over and discuss your ideas, and, they, and they're very nice, and it really grates me. I tell you, I want to go over there and rage at the warmongers and say how awful they are and use these epithets, and they're so cordial and kindly, and, and I feel as though I'm being defanged. Uh, and... It, and, and they always end up, well, uh, the guy will, at the end, well, Paul, we're glad you're here, and thank you for coming. After all, we both have the same goals. We just disagree about the means. <laughs> and, oh, so I don't know why I do it, but I keep going over and, and hoping you might get a little convert, somebody read a book now and then, and... Uh, and they probably think the same, and they always give me their literature about why we need the MXs in Wyoming and so forth. And so on it goes. But uh, so it's a hard thing to decide about how, how, how effective uh, we are, and and that and that and that gets us down to the third, uh, the third um, part, uh, the third of the Trinity, I guess, of of trying to be effective. Uh, and that's exorcism, and that really is is simply uh, we all know what it means to drive out uh, to drive out the evil, and 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 what is evil? Uh, all the theologians and philosophers have wrestled with it, and as far as I can figure out by reading as many of them as I can, is that is that evil is anything that's violent. I know that's that's simplifying it, but. That covers enough ground for me. Enough of the waterfront is violent, and and, and we we can begin there, and then and then become uh, atomistic scholars after that, and, and, and start the quibbling. But anything that's violent uh, is is really evil, and we have to drive that out. Yeah, and that's why I've been trying to get uh, peace studies uh, courses in the colleges and in the high schools and grade schools, so that uh, so that it becomes a, a, a kids can a, can a, a can think about that uh, um, early on. So it doesn't it doesn't come as a foreign idea. Well, well, yeah, it works for Gandhi. I often hear that one. But after all, the British were civilized, and 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 the Russians aren't. So we got to get the nukes and get ready for the dirty Russians. And you hear that one a lot. And another one you hear, yeah, it's a great idea, but what about Hitler? Uh, uh, the fact is that uh, the number one that uh, 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 we didn't stop Hitler with bombs and guns and weapons. The idea is still around. Uh, Hitler is in Chile 
uh, through that government. It's in uh, the Soviet Union with that government. Uh, there are still uh, concentration camps. We have not defeated uh, uh, that enemy. And as long as we think about uh, using uh, the word uh, defeat, uh, we're always going to be frustrated. Uh, the idea that Gandhi taught and that Christ taught is not to defeat your enemy, uh, but to become uh, reconciled with him. It's hard for us to think that way. We're a win-lose society. Uh, someone's got to win, someone's got to lose. We have the football team, they're going wild now. The season is, is here, and, and the win and lose thing is, again, rampant. Uh, uh, the nonviolent person doesn't want to defeat anybody. We all want to just become reconciled and, and, and go ahead that way. Um, and, and, and there are ways to do that, uh, that we don't try to, uh, we try to convert the enemy's thinking. That's what happened in, in a little French village in the early 1940s, uh, when uh, Hitler's army was, uh, was uh, stood up to by a group, uh, a small town, of Protestants who, who had been educated in the ways of organized nonviolence. Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed is the name of a book that was written by a man named Philip Hawley, H-A-L-L-I-E. And Lest Innocent Blood came out about four or five years ago. It's a beautiful book. It tells about uh, the French village uh, that was nonviolent, how they organized uh, and of about seven or eight uh, towns in this one valley in southern France, uh, the other seven or eight, they got the guns, they organized, they were going to be violent, and they were going to uh, sh have a shootout with the Nazis. Well, the Nazis came, of course, and they were delighted to have a shootout, and they killed off those villages. When they came to the last town, where there was non-resistance and violence, one general...